welcome so much to this talk about art optimization in the 41st millennia. Um, I just want to have a quick check uh, in here. Hands up, how many play Dark Tide? That's a few. Um, hands up, how many people that know about Simplicon? All right, a few. Pretty good, we didn't need to have this talk. I think they know everything. Um, also, if I appear a bit loopy, it's because um, I um, have a small concussion. I played chicken race with a tree last night uh, in the storm and the tree won. So that's a, you know, if I fall off the stage, you'll know why. Um, so, yeah. Um, also, just a quick note that optimization is a huge topic. We can do this for days, uh, but we picked up, so, uh, picked out some stuff that um, we think that you might enjoy. Um, so, before we uh, go into the nitty-gritty details, I would like to introduce ourselves, and I will start with myself. This is me. I'm Chris Larson. I've been working with games for the past 25 years. Um, and I worked like in tons of studios throughout the world. Uh, now I am back in my home country, Stockholm, and working for uh, Fat Shark as a technical producer and a tools lead. Um, I started my career as an artist, but then quickly fell to the dark side and became a programmer. And that's sort of where I'm, where where things just shot off. Um, and this lovely gentleman to my left um, is going to introduce himself now. Uh, yes, he will. Yes, so I'm uh, Jesper Tingvall. Uh, my background is in the indie scene in Sweden, and I've also been doing game jam arranging for eight years. So if you do that for eight years, you get around 40 pretty crappy games uh, made. Uh, but yeah, so my passion is getting new people into the industry, and uh, I combine that with doing my job at Simplygon, where I help game developers create games that run beautifully. So. Yeah, asset optimization, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. The agenda is the following. First, we're going to do a little bit of uh, asset op optimization overview in general. So we're going to look at the worst offenders uh, from an asset point of view and uh, how to solve them. Then we're going to have a look at uh, this from a game production point of view. So we're going to look at Dark Tide and the free uh, challenges. We're going to look at our character kit bashing, asset merging, asset merging, and level imposters. All right, that's mine. Cool, cool. Um, so before we go into the more specific cases, and in order to get everyone up to speed, we, as I said, we're going to start with some general um, graphical performance optimizations. And um, I know that some of you already know a bunch of this stuff, but um, stay tuned, and uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll get back into into the production details pretty fast. Um, so, what is performance? Well, performance, simply put, is how much work that the processor can do with a certain limit of time. And if the processor gets more work than can be completed in this um, amount of time, it's counted as a loss of performance. So let's take an example. If you have a game that needs to run in, say, 30 frames per second to not appear laggy, uh, all calculations of that frame must be done in 0 0.03 seconds. Now, if the uh, processor can't complete um, all the computations of that frame in this time limit, it will still continue uh, and to complete that frame regardless of how long it takes to finish it. Um, so, um, in a bad spot of the game, a frame might take up, uh, end up taking up 0 0.09 seconds. That doesn't seem like a lot of time, however, it will result in a game barely running at 11 frames per second. Um, yes. So let's just align on the fact that this is not really how we want a game to look, right? But it looks very optimal. It is very optish. Um, I mean, it has um, you know very low risk textures and you know very tiling materials and stuff. That's you know you can get a pretty decent frame rate, but we don't really want anything that looks like this. So we're aiming at something running at 60 frames per second and looking more more like this. Um, 
All right. Um, let's uh, look into these kind of main offenders that we're talking about. Um, we're going to focus on a few things. We're going to talk about the number of batches. We're going to talk about number of triangles, and more importantly, the triangle size. And we're going to quickly skim more shaded complexity, and we're going to talk a bit about overdraw. So, number of batches. Everything that gets processed uh, and rendered in game is called a batch. The optimization goal here is to uh, basically create as few batches as possible. So let's uh, look at some things that create batches and um, how that can be avoided. One way to think of it is that each separate object creates um, one batch for each material. A single object with one material creates one batch, a single object but with two materials creates two batches, and two objects with two materials will then create four batches. Now, there are more things like animation poses and other things that uh, will create extra batches, but meshes and materials are the most prominent ones. Now, I assume that some of you will go, well, is this really correct? Well, it is, but there is a trick that most new systems are using, uh, which is called instancing. Um, so, basically, it's a way of processing multiple batches at the same time. So, basically merging several batches together. For example, if uh, multiple batches share the same mesh and the same material, but have different material properties, they can be processed together. So, instead of what I said before, that this thing actually had that two objects with two materials had four batches, they can actually just be two batches. Um, right, um, another thing that I want to quickly mention is that shadows are also split into batches. You can think of this as each material on a mesh casts at least uh, one batch of shadow. Uh, depending on your shadow technique, of course, and uh, the amount of shadow casters you're using, um, I must also say that the shadow batches can be many, many more, as I said, depending on if you have multiple shadow casters and stuff. Um, also keep in mind that hidden objects and triangles uh, cast shadows even if you can't see them. So let's look at some tips and tricks for this part. Instead of having separate objects in, in like your editor, merge them uh, so that all meshes with the same material is one mesh, where you can, of course. Um, if you have moving parts, uh, don't animate them separately, but rather uh, combine it to one mesh and skin it to a rig and animate the rig. Bake several textures into one, uh, so you will create a single material. Uh, and for the shadows, a neat trick is, is to use shadow meshes, if you have the memory for them, uh, so that you do a specific mesh that only casts shadows, but and also have just a single material on it. Um, that means that you will only have one, basically one batch of shadow for, for this object. Um, and I think the next session is you, correct? Yes. Okay, now uh, I'm gonna reveal a big secret for you, and it's something that they want to keep from you, those rendering engineers. And the thing is, we always talk about polycount this and polycount that, and the truth is, I mean, for video game-ish uh, assets, polycount hasn't really been an issue for quite a, a while. No, uh, the issue is the size of triangles. Sadly, not in the way that you just can take all of your assets, scale them up to 100%, and then, poof, now it runs flawlessly. Uh, sadly, that is not the case. Instead, what matters is triangle size on screen. And in order to explain why, we need to delve a little bit into GPU architecture, and we're gonna, there are so many different GPU architectures out there, so we're gonna be super generic, uh, but the lesson will still apply. So, uh, this is a GPU. Um, at least in war the Warhammer universe. Um, and um, the thing is, GPUs are good for one thing, render pixel to your screen. You will have a lot of other talks here that will explain that they are sentient and should do AI stuff, but no, let's not focus on that. Let's focus on rendering pixels to the screen. 
and they have a lot of cores, a lot of very specialized cores. In fact, they're so specialized that not all of them have something called an instruction fetcher. An instruction fetcher is what tells them what to do. For example, do addition, do multiplication. So instead, they're, groups, they're grouped into groups, and then they obey the same instruction. Uh, so it has a so-called single instruction multiple data architecture. Uh, how these groups are then used, or these groups are then used, is that you render your scene triangle by triangle, block by block. If you have large triangles, a lot of these blo blocks will be fully covered by them. If you have small triangles, a lot of these will kind of only be partially covered. And what does that mean? Well, it means that this group of uh, cores, uh, some of them will just sit and be idle and just not contribute anything. So if we render things that has a bunch of tiny triangles, we will not use the GPU efficiently. We can also look at something called quad utilization. So if we go down one step, this is not the kind of quad you're used uh, to from modeling. No, this is are something called quad pixels. So the pixels on your screen, depending on GPU, are usually grouped into groups of four. And that's due to that you want to calculate derivative that you use for texture filtering functions. But the same thing applies here. If our triangle only covers these quads partially, the rest of them will not contribute to things you see on the screen. So, here is an example of that. Uh, furthest away from me, uh, we have a, an asset that has, well, tiny triangles in it, and we can see that red is obviously bad, and uh, it has a lot of red. And it, the further away it goes, the more red it is, the more bad it is. That's the lesson for quad utilization. Uh, the model that's uh, close to me has level of detail added, so we're now going to the solution in beforehand, and here we can see that we have much better quad utilization because it has larger triangles. And observant of you might notice that, hey, I, I should be able to figure out a way to get the, this problem without having uh, uh, small triangles, and that's correct. You can also have sliver triangles, so if you have long, long, triangles, well, yeah, you will get the same problem. You will cover a lot of quad pixels on your screen, but only partially, so you will have the same problem. So what can we do to solve this? Well, use appropriately sized triangles, preferably as large triangles as you can get away with. But yeah, maybe depending on engine, maybe 10 pixel triangles or something. Uh, if you're obvious, I'm gonna if your objects are gonna be viewed at different distances, for example, you might walk around in the world or have things running towards you and want to murder you. Uh, those are very common in games. Um, then you want to create different versions of that asset with larger and larger triangles. And that's the reason why you do LOD chains. And lastly, keep triangle shape in mind. Don't create the, the thin long boys. And as a segue into Chris's segment, I, and that is shader complexity, I can add that this problem is sort of multiplied by your shader complexity. So if you have very simple shaders, you might not run into issues with this, but if you have complex shaders, yeah, subsurface scattering, all of the nice character skin shaders, you will pay a lot if you have tiny triangles and render them. Now, over to you. Okay. So, as I said before, uh, shader complexity is, uh, yeah, it's complex. I, I can talk about this probably for two hours. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly mention some things uh, in regards to shader complexity. Um, oh, and like, the gist of it is basically, if you have a shader that does tons of fan uh, fancy visual magic, uh, it's a lot more expensive to render a pixel with that in uh, comparison to just a shader that renders out vertex colors, for example. Um, yes. Um, I can just mention um, kind of a story uh, from, um, I'm not gonna mention the company, I'm not gonna mention the artist, but I can mention that uh, 
at a certain point in time, uh, not in this studio, um, but we found out that after the artists have checked in some content, the entire game basically ran at like 11 frames per second. And they didn't really know why. We looked at this a scene that just contained like trees and rocks and still like the game wasn't running at all. Um, after some digging, we find out, found out that uh, this artist have actually put the skin shader on everything in the entire game. I can tell you that if you use a fancy skin shader with subsurface scattering and all that magic on everything, you won't have running game. So like, keep that in mind. Um, but I mean, it's wonderful. It's a, it's a chaos world now. Everything is made out of flesh. True, true. Like if you're doing a flesh game, I, I don't even want to go there. Like I, I, I have pictures in my mind. I can't, I can't. Wait, we, we just continue now. I, all right, that's gonna be great. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just gonna cover some some uh, tips and tricks for the shaders part, and then move over to uh, overdraw. Um, as we said, use as cheap and simple shaders as you can. It's as itself. Uh, and when you're creating shaders, especially if you're using some sort of node-based system like from Unreal or whatever, it's very easy to just keep on adding nodes. But at the end, you might have 15 multiplies and add and whatnot that in the end just ends up being a, a static black or white color. Uh, so just recheck your math after you have done something that you think looks good so, so you don't have like a bunch of uh, instructions that basically doesn't do anything. Um, I just want to mention two things uh, really quickly as well. Um, reading textures, aka samplers, are one of the most um, expensive instructions in a shader. So make sure that you use as few as possible and um, like use all channels of a texture if you're using masks, etc. So you don't have several black and white textures. Um, that way you can um, just reduce the amount of samplers. Uh, also, I know that artist loves power functions to get their assets a little bit more crisp. Power functions are one of the most expensive instructions there is. Uh, so try to stay away from them wherever you can and ask your friendly coder to maybe figure out a way around not using that power function but get the same result. Um, all right. Um, Where am I? Yes, okay. I already said we were going to talk about. I am on stage. This is true. Um, we already said we were going to talk about overdraw, and this is where we start with that. Um, so, drawing pixels with expensive shaders is, well, expensive, right? But drawing the same pixel over and over again for no reason is. Uh, it's not great either. Um, so, let's have a look at this example. Um, when an object is made of a single mesh, uh, like the one on the, on the far end here, um, it's rendered, it's only rendered once, so you can see on the screen here. Um, however, when an object is kind of composed out of several meshes stuck together, um, it becomes a bit more, it, it becomes a different scenario. So a real life example of this would be something like this, which is sort of a, rubble pile where you take a bunch of meshes, you just stick them into each other, and you have a bunch of insides and whatnot for no reason. So let's get back to the simpler um, uh, example now. So we have this, this kind of box again that's made out of two primitives. So as before, we're gonna start with rendering one, uh, or render the first one, and then we're gonna render the second one. Now that means that these pixels in the middle have been rendered twice. They have been drawn twice, they have been overdrawn. And with those pixels, like we could use them to like draw other fancy stuff. So this is this is just a waste of performance. So um, simply put, remove the hidden triangles, remove the stuff on the insides that you can't see. That will completely uh, like in the example that we had before, if you just would remove the triangles that were inside a bigger box, you wouldn't have had overdrawn that particular uh, thing. And sew meshes together uh, where you can to create a solid shell. Uh, even if this forces you to create more triangles, it's very often worth it. 
And remember, it's pixels we're trying to save. So cutting triangles uh, to remove more of them on the insides of things, um, it's always worth it, even if it creates more vertices, uh, because the overdraw is, is so m much more expensive. All right. I think that uh, maybe we should uh, play a, a little bit of a, of a trailer. Look at some dark side stuff. All right, let's do that. These rejects, the best you've got. Throw. Let's see what you can do. Welcome to Atoma, your home for the rest of your brief lives. Used to be the jewel in the sector. Then the heretics invaded. I need you to go down there and raise hell. Can't say for sure what's waiting in the shadows. Valkyrie exfiltration will be waiting. If you make it that far. <laughs> Get moving! Extraction inbound! Move it! Move your arses! Zola! We're gonna need more rejects. Right. Um, of course, the game is already out, uh, but this is an, an old slide, so yeah. Yes, so and I should say it's an amazing game. I love it. I've had so much fun in it. But yes, so now we looked at asset optimization from an individual asset point of view, like how to solve this for one asset. And now instead, let's approach this from a game production point of view. So how to solve asset optimization at scale. And uh, of course, you could do this manually uh, for every step. But the thing is, you have a lot of content in video games. And you also have ever-changing conditions. Like, oh, you're, some business guy decides it should also be on another platform. Or, oh, we discover that we have, uh, are running out of memory, so we need fewer polygons. And if you go to your artist uh, last month and say, hey, uh, please redo everything, but just use half the polygons, they will not be happy. And that's the reason why uh, we at Simpleon, we're good at asset optimization, we're, we're not good at game production. In fact, we don't even make games. And that's why we're joined by Fat Shark here on the stage, because you do really good games. Yeah, and with some help from optimization, it kind of works too, I am the same. But. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And now let's delve into character kit bashing, asset merging, and level imposters. All right, smooth switch there. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, so let's look into some kit bashing in characters. Now, this is, I would say, probably one of the biggest trends in, uh, in the game industry. Uh, so if you don't know what kit bashing means, it's basically taking, you're basically doing a bunch of different assets and then you combine them differently. Uh, to create unique assets. So for example, for a character, if you have three upper bodies and three lower bodies, it could potentially become nine unique characters. Now, this is generally a very fast way of creating a lot of content. However, it's not that straightforward to optimize it. Uh, for example, in our game, we have well over just 100 upper 500 upper bodies. Um, and many more of other pieces, and more are coming every day. Uh, they're also done by different people. Um, I mean, to ease the burden, um, 
all of these pieces have already seams that can't really be changed, but all of these pieces also need LOD steps that we talked about before. They need different versions of the assets that are, um, yeah, that, that have different quality settings or, yeah, different quality. Um, and the way to solve this is either to do the LODs manually uh, or to tell an automated system to not crunch the connecting triangles at all. And this is also a, a huge waste of performance. Um, we are currently using Maya for our characters and with that the Simplicon plugin for, for optimization. Um, and I think it was last time we met up at GDC, right? Where we started talking about this, how we can resolve the issues with kit bashing characters and, and yeah, optimizing seams and things like that, right? Yep. I think so, yeah. And it, it is quite interesting that we're back here and GDC and doing this again. But after some brainstorming dedication, um, we kind of figured out a way of doing this and uh, you have some news to share, I guess. Uh, yes, I have. Okay, now this was a really smooth transition as well. Yes. So, uh, just a, a really fun thing with this modeler seam optimization thing we're gonna show. This is in fact a sign of that drinking beer at GDC is a good thing because it started with beer. Since it was post-pandemic GDC, it was quite a lot of beers. So a little bit of foggy memories. But the nice thing with this is that it showcases how we at Simplicon like to work with people. Like, we're really here to solve hard optimization problems for developers. And with Simplicon, or with Fatshark, we work for you with the last, better part of last decade, and uh, you are basically an employee by Simplicon, of Simplicon by now because you work for us as long as we have existed. Yeah, pretty much. We've, we've done stuff together for, for a long, long time now. And he doesn't realize he's an employee yet. Okay, now let's I'm not look at paid, so I mean. <laughs> Okay, now let's look at what we came up with. Modular assets require extra care when optimizing. Otherwise, modules might not connect and cracks appear along the seams. Our new modular content optimizer ensures that seams are optimized the same way across parts, allowing reduced topology to connect perfectly. All right, so um, the keyword here is deterministic reduction. You're going to hear me say that a lot. So Muller, as you can see here, here is our character. And you can see that he's not looking that good. He has some battle injuries in the neck and uh, near the arm. And this is what happens if you take the arms and the head and the torso and optimize them individually because they're going to make different decisions on how to optimize this seam. And what people have been doing so far are different strategies to avoid it. So one way to solve this would perhaps to be to put a scarf on our ogrin. So hide the seam, basically. It's not really an ideal uh, solution because it constrains your art style to everybody needs to have something around their neck and have something around their arm. So we cannot have buff, beautiful, naked dudes in our games, and that's sad. Everyone wants a naked ogrin. I'm just saying. Uh, it exactly. makes sense. <laughs> exactly. This is, this is the fan service slide, just so you know. Um, but it also means that wait, you should, it should ring a bell from what we talked about earlier. You're now putting something underneath something. We're introducing overdraw. And we're introducing overdraw on a character, so overdraw is really expensive here. And you, you're, we're also limiting how we can slice them up. Uh, yeah, that was morbid. Okay, next solution to this one would be, as Christer said, let's not just ignore optimization in the seam. So lock the seam and we do nothing there. Uh, we would get a lot of tiny triangles as, and expensive triangles because characters, so not good at all. Uh, last solution would be, be to make your artist cry because, hey, make the lods, please, all of them. How many did you have? I don't, I, I think like of all the main character items, I, I mean, I don't know, the thousands, like, yeah, it, it's not fun to do them all manually. I think our artists would rather create new assets and, you know, be creative. 
Yes, so let's look at how this works. So the first thing we want to do is to analyze the different parts, how they fit together and how to reduce. So we're going to take a bunch of different heads, a bunch of different torsos, a bunch of different arms, things that should fit together. We figure out in which, which vertices these should line up and how we should reduce that seam deterministically so each part get, looks as good as possible. Once we have done that, we can save, save that data to a file. And now, whenever we do optimization on assets individually, we just bring that file along and say, hey, you should keep this thing in mind when you do it. And the result is an ogrin. This is also the fan service slide, but he's not injured. In fact, he fits together. And uh, yeah, he, he looks good. So uh, it's not just uh, kit bashing and characters that are an issue. Let's look at kit bashing of uh, environments. Yes. Um, this is in, in contrast to the other thing that happened in Maya. This is sort of, um, it's, it's kind of the same thing, but it's done in the level editor. So uh, this is a building made of many small individual pieces. Um, again, it's super fast for the level designers to just have a bunch of building blocks, a bunch of Lego pieces, and they can build yeah, hundreds of different houses um, or buildings with just reusing these pieces and combining them dif differently. Um, so um, we integrated Simplicon, uh, Simplicon directly in our editor via the C Sharp and C++ API. Um, for easy access to our level artists when, when they're optimizing levels. So we built our own interface uh, that directly talked to various level systems and load settings and things like that, uh, but also have the load creation settings from Simplicon. So basically this is uh, on your far, on, yeah, on the, on the far end here, you basically have a panel that controls all of that stuff so it's easy for level art to just uh, yeah, one, once they're done with the piece, just uh, press a couple of buttons and override things if you want to, but this is basically a, a three button click to get an optimized version out of this. Um, so how do we go about optimizing this asset? Well, for the original LOD step, uh, I mean the original meshes, um, we move all of these meshes into one asset, uh, and then we remove all the insights and hidden geometry. In the Simplicon toolset, this is called aggregation, by the way. Um, however, we don't want to merge all the meshes uh, into one at this step, as this will make frustum culling work um, less efficient. So if you, for example, just see the lower end of this wall piece, um, then if it is an entire mesh, you can't frust them, call it, and it will all go to the render. Um, so that's why we don't really want to do that up close. However, the last load, this is exactly what we want to do, because the, the, the likeliness of you being, a, or the likeliness of you seeing all of this uh, at the same time is very high when, you, when you're further away. Um, so that is uh, sort of what we want to do with the, with the last load step. Uh, but we also want to do one more thing, and that is to bake all of the textures and materials together uh, to further reduce the, the batch counts. Okay. So here, here you can simply see that on the, on the my side, uh, the, this kind of thing doesn't have any insights anymore. Uh, so all of that extra jazz is, is removed. Now, this material baking thing, it is quite tricky because many have super complex shaders. They are blending multiple textures with vertex colors, for example. Um, they have a lot of artist-controlled inputs. Um, so for that reason, we kind of needed to create our own baking solution. 
Um, so using our own render pipeline, we first render out the combined textures with all its shader magic um, to its own render target um, with objects unfolded UVs. These textures are then assigned to a new material uh, and then applied to the new mesh. Now, the reason I'm not really going to spend time going into exactly how we implemented this is because um, I heard some rumors that um, Simplegon might have a new solution for this that will make it easier for all of you. Yes, so I've been saying the entire day that Simplegon at GDC is like, uh, it's like Christmas, but we are Santa. But now we are actually not just Running, running around all over the place, we're actually delivering presents. So, I will introduce a thing called compute casting. And compute casting is a thing that allows you to use the shaders you use in your game to do this material baking, rather than, yeah, introducing your own system or do other things. But first, let's look at what is material baking. Let's look at a little video. If you have texture budget to spare, create an even further optimized hollow shell using aggregation with material merging enabled and reduce a complex kit bashed object down to just one draw call. So yes, so this was not from Dark Tide, very important to, um, to explain that. No, uh, so, uh, mat so what, material uh, or material, material costing is done when you either want to take a lot of materials and put them into one, so a lot of different uh, textures into one, or you want to transfer textures from, or materials from one mesh to another. And uh, in order to do that properly, we need to understand what is displayed on the screen, so how your shader works. And before, what you had is either you introduce your own baking solution, uh, or you had to do use something called Simplicon Shading Network, where you basically recreate your uh, shader in, and that is not an ideal solution because yeah, now you have two shader systems to support and develop during runtime or during your development, and that is not good. Uh, that is double the work. Compute casting works like this: your GLSL or HLSL code lets you use it. Uh, so if, you can, if we can use your shaders as compute shaders, we can cast them. So I will now give an example of this in Unity, uh, which is the engine I'm proficient in. So here we have two textures, uh, that's our input, and our model that has vertex colors on it. We have also a shader that is very simple. So it basically samples both textures and then lerps in between them, depending on the vertex color. And the result looks like this up here. We have a rock that has snow where we painted it with vertex colors. Now, since the shader wasn't a complete HLSL shader, it has a had a bunch of Unity magic in it and includes some things. Uh, I've introduced a few helper function that makes it into a complete HLSL shader. And let's and that means that we can then use it from. Yeah, in, the, in this case, I made a script uh, that runs inside Unity. We had our asset with our custom, uh, custom uh, shaders uh, for it. We ask it to, hey, can you uh, make this into one texture? And the output looks like this. So it has understood the shader that we've used, used to render it. And uh, we believe that this can be useful not only for like look, merging asset up close or fairly close, but also for, for the next thing, which is level imposters. Yep. All right. Um, this section we will go into uh, some of the things that I talked about um, uh, before as well, uh, where we want to basically create an asset or create a mesh out of, of the many. Um, but before we tackle this, I would just like to give you a brief interview and uh, overview, obviously, uh, of how our, our um, level structure looks. So 
In our, our levels are uh, built uh, in a way that we have a large geographical zone, and inside this zone we have, uh, you can play several missions, but um, all the mission doesn't really, like you don't play in all areas of the zone in all missions. So there are some areas that you can only see from afar, um, and obviously in those areas we don't want to load up all the assets uh, we need something very cheap, some sort of far representation of it. Um, so uh, that is why we kind of need this um, thing that we call the level imposter. So here you can see a view from a mission in the throne side zone. And if you look between these buildings, um, this is actually, because uh, in, in this mission you can't really play in this area. Uh, but you can see it, so we made a level imposter out of all of those assets. Um, and this is a view from the other side that was uh, a level imposter before, and in this mission yeah. it's the other way around, and where we were standing before is now a level imposter. You can see the bridge and things over there. Um, now, when we were using our, the regular loading tricks that we have, <laughs> Optimizing these many assets, um, they could be thousands of them in, in, in this particular part. And it's just, um, yeah, it didn't really work. It didn't look like anything or the polycount was way too high. Um, so we kind of needed another solution, um, except just reducing triangles, for example. Um, and as I said, like there's no way we want to do this manually because you know it could be thousands of assets. It's just it's just not fun to do. Um, but luckily for us, Simplicon, as I said, have a solution for this. Okay. Yes. And allow me to introduce remeshing. Uh, so this is nothing new. It's been around for quite a while. But let's explain why this as is an ideal use case for it. So what we want to have is things that are really, really far away in the game. We want large triangles, and it doesn't really contribute anything to gameplay in most cases. It's just there for eye candy. So we want it very cheap to render. And uh, what we would want, preferably, is to solve this using all of the lessons we had in the first uh, part. So it should have large triangles. It should have no overdraw, so it should be watertight and it should only give us one draw call. And that is exactly what we will do with remeshing. Let's watch a little video of it. Simply gone remeshing with material merging generates a heavy optimization of a mesh with a new set of materials. The result is a low cost, lightweight mesh for viewing at a distance. And again, uh, this is not in the Warhammer universe, uh, sadly. <laughs> Although it might look quite uh, dystopian. Uh, so, if we would, uh, so, so if we would approach this as an artist, like, okay, let's create a really, really low poly load <coughs> for this uh, building piece, what would we end up with? We would probably uh, end up with this box, like that's the lowest we can go. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it looks very optimal, it has large triangles and everything. Uh, now, let's try to reduce this instead. Yes, uh, then we get this. It, it does not look good. Uh, it looks actually quite horrible. So, why is that the case? Uh, well, uh, reduction works by removing triangles. Uh, so you pretty much pick the best triangle and remove it, and then you do that a bunch of times. And the key thing here is that it works upon existing connectivity. So you're just removing stuff. You won't fill those holes by removing things. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, and that is usually what you want to do if you have things that are really, really, really far away. Imagine like a house with uh, windows in it. Uh, so, uh, if we instead approach this problem volumetrically, so we totally disregard connectivity in it, instead 
we can create a volumetric representation of it and then triangulate it, we will get this one. So we have a box, wonderful. But this doesn't, it has a new set of UVs and everything, so what we need to do then is to do material casting from the original mesh. And now I should add that there are some UV stretching in this one, but it's, it's that this one is really, really low poly and should only be viewed far away. Now it's really, really up close. Um, but yes, so um, this is one of the things where I think the compute caster can really come into play because, yeah, you can use your own shaders to create your distance imposter. And if we take a, this back into the game, we have that portion over there. So we have something, it's eye candy for the player, the world feels much more alive, and we spend very little resources actually rendering that part. So, um, what have we learned so far? All right, let's do a little recap. Um, from the general optimization section, I don't need both of these microphones, I just figured out. Um, uh, merge your meshes and materials wherever you can. Create LODs and think about the triangle sizes and shapes as well. Um, and of course, remove the hidden triangles and objects that uh, yeah you can't see, like stuff inside stuff, even if it has vertices, as it's almost always worth it. Yes, uh, so if we instead look at optimization from a production point of view. So you're probably gonna have some kind of modeler content in place that you want to have fitting together. So have a strategy or have tools to handle that because what you really don't want to end up is you sitting there and needing to fix a lot of things manually because yeah, they're probably not be connected after optimization. Kit bashing is wonderful for creating games. It's very quick uh, and amazing, but it introduces some performance issues. And more interestingly, you have different performance issues depending on your distance to the object. If you're up close, you're probably more concerned with overdraw and internal geometry. As you go further away, you want to have larger and larger triangles. And up to a certain point, you probably want to bake your materials into one because you could have a lot of different meshes in it. And then if you talk about things that are really, really far away, like, oh, here is a town that's only far away in the distance or something, instead of approaching it from a reduction point of view, meaning that you look at removing triangles from it, rather approach it from a remeshing point of view, so create a new mesh from it. How do we do that? Yes. So, uh, and with all that said, uh, all that remains for us is to say thank you for listening. So there is a ton of more things we could have talked about, but we kind of optimized down the talk to these parts. Absolutely. And um, feel free to email us or uh, come over here with uh, some uh, Questions. We will also be in the Microsoft, uh, not booth, but the, um, the, the lobby. Yeah, the, uh, the, the Microsoft stall in in the lobby of the South. Um, so if you have more stuff, uh, please come there, and we will chat with you. Um, but now we have twelve minutes for questions, I believe. And please use the mic in the middle. Um, and yeah, thank you. Hey, nice talk. Um, one question. Could you use some of these tools uh, just like in the runtime? I assume you mostly use them like this at like, like at the build time or like in, in the edit editor. Are some of them maybe fast enough to use in the runtime? Uh, so uh, this, the tools we have at SimpliGon is currently only uh, offline, mm -hmm. uh, so we don't. Okay, sorry. Uh, so the question was uh, can these tools be used during runtime? Uh, and uh, uh, at SimpliGon, we only do solutions that run offline uh, currently during production. Uh, but 
Yeah, I mean, some of those things could maybe be done. Uh, I mean, the same techniques would still apply, like aggregate your materials into one, for instance. Yeah, it's or, just a matter of like how fast can you make it. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Mm? I guess I uh, just wanted to, uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate why if you could bash like a few rocks together, for example, and then you remove the inside uh, vertices or inside geometry, um, why you would want to go through the process of also welding things together and making sure it's watertight, or if there's maybe cases where it's fine to, you know, kind of leave it as is. You want it or should I? So, if I answer the question is when you kit bash, if there are uh, times where it's fine to not create a watertight mesh. Um, and I would say in the case that I had with, um, with a large structure, um, it does make sense to not, um, if, if you can see it up close, for example, then like you don't want to break uh, the frustum culling working, so in that case, maybe it's better to have them as separate meshes because then the frustum culling can, then it can make sure that you're not sending parts of it up for render. Um, but I think that's probably the only, only time it's, it's sort of a good, good way to leave them um, because there's, there are quite often uh, like light bleeds and things in, in games. So if you're not making it watertight and removing like all of the insides and things, there might be some bleeding to it. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, I think that is it. And as we said, please email us or visit us at the uh, Simply Install. Um, again, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>